questions can be very short. I only just met Alan uh, Britt about a half an hour ago. So um, now I know he exists. <laughs> and um, so I'll just have him come up and introduce himself and, and uh, read for you now. Oh, oh, before that, we have, we have books on sale from many of the authors, as well as the anthology of music of the Aztec. Um, they're on sale between five and ten dollars um, each, right? The music of the Aztecs is ten, and other poets will tell you what their, their prices are. I don't know. I, I, I don't want to talk for them. So uh, with that in mind, and there's, a, uh, there's an honor box over there. All right, um, so Alan, thanks. To a hereafter party, 
with all those poets swarming a giant kidney bar, the color of hibernating grizzly hair, with neon rainbows dusting naked male and female shoulder blades, swishing hand-painted ostrich feathers while igniting exotic drinks. I'd be greeted with, how'd you like that word I whispered into your last love poem, that word clicking its ironic marionette hips of lust in time to seduce hope in your latest love poem, or the 10,000 lines written 10,000 times before in 10,000 different ways. They'll hound me, these poets, long dead, but not forgotten, sucking every morsel of lascivious marrow from my literary canon. Canon, okay, that's a stretch. But literary life often fantasized as a life of leisure. I say try it sometime. If you believe you can cultivate a lexicon beyond all the lexicons from all the poets who've ever lived, then go ahead. Be a poet. I think this works. I guess that gets me out. It keeps, it keeps thinking. <laughs> of common prayer, and it was inspired by a song uh, by Roseanne Cash, you know, Johnny Cash's daughter. Yeah, I like Roseanne Cash. So I uh, published this poem in a, a wonderful journal, independent journal called Osiris, out in this, comes out of Massachusetts. And um, I believe that Osiris is in its 46th year, which is amazing for an independent journal. But anyway, uh, so my friend Jeffrey Himes, who is a music critic, he puts uh, music reviews in all the, the best uh, music venues around the country, he saw the poem and he sent it to Roseanne Cash. She was in touch with Roseanne Cash. She got back to him. She liked, uh, in particular, a line that says, uh, just in time to whistle a hairline crack in the way things never were. She thought that was particularly interesting. I thought it was thrilling to, get, to hear from Rosie Cash, frankly. Anyway, it's called 50,000 Watts of Common Prayer. Freight train squeals rusted wheels across the frozen tundra of Europa, just in time to whistle a hairline crack in the way things never were. Prokofiev rolled up his sleeves one day and spotted a gunmetal bird that resembled a wild cello in the middle of Siberia digging for a copper key. But instead of a copper key, Prokofiev discovered a piano made of sandstone, hiving a chorus of angelic wasps, buzzing 50,000 watts of common prayer. Freight train squeals rusted wheels across the frozen tundra, just in time to whistle a hairline crack in the way things never were. This is a poem called Running. It speaks for itself. I ran through dreams made of palmetto fronds. I should have known better, but I forgot who I was for a millisecond in the scheme. I couldn't help myself. I escaped scorpion cacti, coral snakes, rusted dragonflies, and jauntist lightning carving Nazi scars along the spines of licorice skinks. So I kept, so I ran and kept on running until one day, hunkered below an orange geometric pattern IHOP multi syrup booth, I glad handed a miracle cure pitch man. Not my finest moment. I ran through dreams made of palmetto fronds. I should have known better, but I forgot who I was for a millisecond in the scheme. I couldn't help myself, so I kept on running. So I'm going to read a handful of poems that come from the uh, wonderful anthology, and thank you all for this uh, book. It's a wonderful book. Some great poetry in this book. 
This one is called The Secretaries. Leaning from Brooklyn skyscrapers, secretaries type hieroglyphs across the clouds. The blue afternoon. The afternoon that greets them as equal lovers, stenographers emerge from Mariposa hibernation. Lovers in silk are money suits. A mythic uncle with a damaged liver stumbles into mass at dawn. His pockets inside out. The bandoneon tracing Dunn's compass tip rocks a cradle woven from straw. Certain women, especially those predisposed to common amnesia, resemble the yellow lightning staining elephant ear plants. With waist attached to gravity, their roots roam the darkness. Tenderness oozes between the secretary's exposed hips. I fall backwards into a net of drunken bats gathered in an after-hours tavern. My insufferable lover arrives with a knife in her heart. Crumbling to my knees, I kiss her suffering hands. The bandoneon swirls the tavern's darkness around us. Stars flicker, then vanish into ashes. This uh, next poem is called The Tavern of Lost Souls, which is the title poem of a book that uh, hopefully will be coming out soon. About the color of amber asleep in a drawer at a North Dakota fossil lab, an ant descends the crack of a sidewalk just below my approaching Reebok. I carry the shadow of Nagasaki in my walk. However, my true agenda is not cruelty. As a matter of fact, each morning around 12 p.m., the mayor of my village walks his burrow past the Chamber of Commerce. Women make important decisions while our men drive SUVs to the local reservoir in search of the wild men. Fewer capital crimes are committed this way. Adolescents, mute since birth, stitch fantasy tattoos across each other's shoulders and lower backs with the lethal precision of Andre Breton and Tristan Zara. Extended families mingle the local watering hole. They cross their shirt, their shriveled legs while lighting up a stick and growl into muddy drinks, all various shades of amber asleep in drawers at a fossil lab somewhere near North Dakota. Finally, just around midnight, a shabby guitarist with crescent moon scar on his forehead and a busted hip saunters into the Tavern of Lost Souls. Uh, this poem is, uh, I know I had to read a dog poem for you. I write a lot of dog poems. This is called Childhood Confessions, and it is based on an actual experience. And, you know, a lot of the poems are, you know, half and half of those. But I was at a pet store once uh, a while back, and the lady came in with a, a pit mix, and you know, pit bulls are maligned, of course. Beautiful dog, friendly to be, wonderful guy. Um, his name was, uh, what was his name? I forgot his name. <laughs> oh, Mason, sorry. So Mason was a wonderful dog. I knew about three years old, something like that. I asked the lady, I said, what? Why? Who abandoned this dog? He's a, he's a great guy. And uh, who knows? I mean, uh, they just got, they moved, they got tired of them. Who knows? This is how animals are treated, unfortunately. But it kind of broke my heart. And at some point, I sat down and ended up writing this poem. Uh, it's called Childhood Confessions. I was adopted at six weeks. I was ecstatic. While young, I pulled some pranks. Nothing too serious. I paraded mom's cashmere sweater across the hardwood floor. She wasn't pleased. I rummaged dad's closet and absconded a deerskin slipper. Admonished for that. 
I once grabbed a chocolate chip cookie bag while spilling garbage from a stainless steel can across the kitchen tiles. I heard about that for weeks, but I matured, learned right from wrong and respected household rules, stopped teasing the cat, and even grew fond of my Maine Coon sister. I often wished Dad had more time to teach me some games. I had energy to spare. I sometimes begged Mom to close her laptop and go for strolls around our neighborhood. She was busy, I could see that. But I amused myself, I made do. I grew fast and avoided trouble, mostly. Recently, Mom and Dad brought home a baby. They named him Tom. He smells funny, but I think I love him. A big brother. I circled the house, exuding jubilation. Then suddenly, the surprise of my life. One morning, Dad walked me to the car and drove me to a building with cinder block walls and concrete floor. I'll never forget. I had just turned five and was overjoyed for our expanding family. Dad patted my head, closed the chain link door, and left me sitting on that concrete floor. I've been here over a month. No sign of mom, no sign of dad. My name is Mason. I'm a pit bull shepherd mix. The terrier next to me was carried away this morning. She was 14 at least cataracts in both eyes. The guy opposite, pound mix, spends all day shriveled in a corner, tail curled around his belly. God, I'm lonely and confused. Mom, Dad, if you can hear me, please come and get me. So, a little bit more uplifting here. Um, <laughs> Finish with a couple of short poems from, again, from the anthology. This one is called All You Need to Know, and of course the uh, archaic language comes from Keats, in my case here. Startled like Maine Coon in a room full of strangers late one afternoon. I remember the ticket coachman, but I don't remember you. I remember a feline soul such as it was, but I don't remember you. So I close my eyes and dream of oilcloth sails meant for you. And sail we do on abalone wings throughout adolescent Bougainvillea and musky misfortunes releasing a poetic virus that the universe wedges between us, which is neither here nor there, but for better or for worse, I built a boat called love that floats, and that is all you need to know. And I'll finish with a poem about Walt Whitman, which I actually wrote while driving across the Walt Whitman Bridge. I don't recommend it, <laughs> but I did. Anyway. Crossing the Walt Whitman Bridge. They have named a bridge after Walt a massive extension of steel and persistent weight. This bridge connects daily lives and supports the multitudes nonstop 24 hours a day. Walt would surely be proud, but the true bridge, the one he created from our lives to the infinite, is the one I'm crossing now between the shores of my solitude. Thank you very much.